Hi, I'm Laura Doman, a voice actor who can narrate your videos, and an on-camera actress with credits in film, TV, commercials, and industrials. But I can do more than just do it for you. I can help you do it yourself. If you're an entrepreneur or a business professional, and you need to be in your own video, well, I can help you become a lot more comfortable, and yes, charismatic on camera yourself. Check me out at lauradoman.com or with any of my free how-to YouTube videos at Laura Doman. But on to Joe, terrific fellow, and he can make you the best podcast guest you can possibly be, starting with his invaluable one sheet to all his pointers. I've been on dozens of podcasts ever since he helped me. Furthermore, I was a guest on his as well, where we talked about the business of voiceover. So check it out. But now, you are listening to the Entrepreneur Journeys podcast with your host, Joe Metz. You're listening to Entrepreneur Journeys, where I share insights and strategies based on owning and managing businesses while traveling and living on three continents. I also interview business owners about their journey, what they learned along the way, and how that can help you with your business growth. For more resources to accelerate your entrepreneur journey, head over to Gapologist.com, where I share resources, events, community, and more. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. Hello, hello. Today, I have with us a fractional CMO, and he's all about not wasting money and not throwing money down the drain in your marketing processes. He helps business owners take control of their marketing strategy so they can better utilize their resources and drive success. Josh Ramsey, welcome to the show. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on here. And I have been through some of your material, man. It looks really good. I appreciate all the educational material there. Yeah, you know, I mean, I I believe in, you know, the clients that I work with. I love and really only work with those clients that are spending enough time to be educated on the material. And it really just takes relationships a lot further so that they know what to expect and what they get. Thus, they they get more out of it, you know? So I love the education of giving people as much as I can to help them grow. And and that's just it. That's the focus, you know? Fantastic. Love, love people, love people, you know? Yeah, and we'll get into all of that, but let's start with this, Joshua. Where do you hail from today? So currently I'm just north of Dallas in a city called McKinney, Texas. That's where I where I live with my family. So Okay, very good. And when you were younger, and I say that with trepidation, uh, let's say high school and middle school, what, was there any indication that you would own a marketing business? No, no. You know, the, the most interesting thing about high school and so forth was I loved the show called The Highlander. And The Highlander, the main part that I liked about that was it was fascinating to me that he was able to live in all these different time periods and experience the world. So when I watched it, you would see him, you know, in all these different settings. And I just found it fascinating that someone, you know, obviously it was not real, but I found it fascinating of what if, and, and that was really kind of my dream. And I guess that kind of took me through uh, phases in my life where I did a lot of uh, I did a lot of things. You know, I worked with my aunt and uncle on a ranch, uh, breaking and training horses, working with dogs, working cattle, um, you know, and then, you know, I played soccer and traveled uh, in high school and then out of high school into college, played college ball and played a little bit of professional. And, you know, so that was really kind of high school and, and so forth is just being able to experience so many different things. And I was lucky to be able to do that. That's so interesting. I'm very familiar with the show. I, I like the show. And um, that is a, a new perspective on the show. And it's in, inspired you to do different things, to get out there and experience the world. That's that's fantastic. I, I would like to see all teenagers incorporate that spirit of adventure. Yeah. You learn a lot. You put yourself in different settings and you just learn so much from different walks of life. So I've seen it you know, from from the slums all the way to, you know, the, the famous and glorious and private jets and everything else and and everywhere in between. And it's just it's really fascinating. And, and that's where you kind of learn to appreciate 
certain people in your life and certain moments in your life. So yeah, it's, it's been a wild ride, but <laughs> sure. You know, and I, I think it builds a lot of, of tolerance for different perspectives. I think it, it builds a lot of, um, a, a lot of, a, a very wide look at what's going on. It's not just your neighborhood, your socioeconomic class. It's, there's all kinds of levels of living out there, if you will, and different ways to live. And not one is more right than the other, depending on where, where your perspective is from. You know, one of the things that I heard when I was younger was very interesting. And it was uh, someone, a motivational speaker said, said, talked about, you know, if, if you could walk into a room and you, we only use one third of our minds, what is that one third? And it's about walking into a room and what's the first thing that you see? And what's the first thing that I see? And it's not that you're right and I'm wrong or that I'm right and you're wrong. It's more about the mindset of whatever someone sees, this is called confirmation bias, which is one of the things that I teach heavily on, but it's whatever they see is accurate, it's true. So if I see a blue wall and you see you know, a white line or a guitar, what's that first thing that we see? And why do we see that? Right. And it's really about understanding the other person's perspective, which does lead into marketing and confirmation bias in marketing as well. But that was one of the most fascinating things. And that leads back to what you said of just understanding other people's perspective and why people make the decisions that they do. And it's based on how they walk into the room. What's yeah. the first thing that they see and why? And right. that's really applicable when it comes to marketing. And we can get into that as, as deep as you'd like to go. Yeah. You know, I, I would express this as my wife and I driving, driving in the car. Usually I'm driving. So she's in the passenger seat. And I will say, oh, there, you know, if I see a bicycle on the road, I could tell you if it's a, it's a gravel bike, it's a road bike, it's a speed bike, it's a time trial bike, it's a mountain bike. If it's full suspension, mm -hmm. if they've got good tires, if the position on the bike is correct. And my wife says, oh, there's a bike. <laughs> <laughs> you're right you're right that's that's you know that's that's the perspective yes you know? but so. but if there was at the same time a dog hanging out the window in a car next to us she'd be able to tell me all about the dog the the breed and the age and all of that <laughs> but you know it's interesting that you say that because again this goes into the uh, another aspect that i teach about which is called your reticular activator and your reticular activator is a mental focus of searching for information that is either comfortable or interesting. And again, there's other levels to that, uh, but it's comfortable or interesting. And it's something that we search for in a subconscious scan. Yes. And when we see something like the bicycle, obviously through your messaging, that's interesting to you or comfort of some level. And when she sees the dog, she feels these emotions. And again, that leads into marketing of how you can use the brain of a human. And we all buy and make decisions on what we purchase, what we do, how we live based on the mental file folders in our brain. So again, Everything that we talk about, it's really interesting when someone goes, well, why a fractional CMO, which I think is one of your questions, yeah. or they say, you know, well, you've never worked in my industry. So how do you know and how can you work in my industry when you when you never have? And I just talked to number one, it, all humans make decisions based on the same thing. And then number two, I educate people and most people don't realize this, but the biggest companies when they hire CMOs. They typically hire from outside their industry because that person brings a fresh perspective to what they're already doing, and they then are able to reinvigorate whatever is happening. Yeah, so that, just a few other tidbits there. That makes perfect sense. You know, if if you have two, if two people always agree on something, one of them is unnecessary. And if you're pulling people from inside your industry who grew up in the industry, has a perspective of the industry, learned from the chief, whatever, in that industry, that's their perspective. And they're, it's oftentimes like blinders. Would I be correct in saying that? It's, it's like blinders and they can't see outside of, of a, a certain lane? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. But I would agree 100% with what you said. You know, I, I was just thinking about a meeting that I had the other day with a client and they talked about how when a new C-level position person is hired, 
you have about 24 months, so two years, to really for them to really make an impact and be open to new insights and information and new strategies. And that's on a totally different industry, nothing to do with marketing. That's just the one industry that some other executive shared with me. And I, I look at that and go, okay, well, I'm not the only one that thinks that way and sees that. It's that fresh perspective. And it doesn't mean that if you've had a marketing person for four years that they can't bring that to the table, but it does mean you should think about how they're fed information, right? Podcasts like this, what information are they getting? I, I listen to podcasts all the time in a lot of different industries, a lot of different information, just to kind of keep myself fresh as to what's out there, what are people doing, what are different industries, how are they marketing those industries? It's just good to stay, you know, stay abreast of what's going on. Right, and looking outside of your industry or your your circle, if, if you will. Uh, so how did your journey begin as a marketing expert? Yeah, so it's interesting, as I would say, of how God can work into your life at times. And for me, uh, you know, I just didn't really have a clear vision of what I should do. I knew and I was always told that I was good at sales, so I went into sales. So I worked for large companies. I don't necessarily want to name them, but I did transit advertising. I did billboards, did magazine, newspaper, radio, different other types of print. Uh, did television. So I sold a little bit of everything and I moved around quite a bit. Part of why I moved around was I could not retain clients and I couldn't figure out why. I was great at selling them and building that relationship, but you know, a retention of a client really comes from them making money. And if they don't make money from whatever medium that they're advertising in, they move on. And it's just simple logic. And they would tell me, there's no hard feelings. It's just we didn't get the ROI. So going through that was was eye-opening at the end when I realized I want to be on the buyer side. I want to be on the agency side, not the sales side. Because here's one thing that I've learned that not many people really acknowledge, and that is when you talk to somebody in sales, they're offering you and trying to convince you that whatever they sell is best for you. So if you talk to an ad agency, Whatever they're good at, that's what they sell you. If it's link building, if it's on-page SEO, uh, what you know, if it's paid ads, that's what they're good at, so that's what they offer. The, the truth is you might not need what they sell, right. but they may be good at convincing you. So the difference of a CMO is to look at it and figure out what's best for the company, not what's best for me selling you that. Now, I go down a rabbit hole just a little bit, to kind of explain why my world shifted, but the world shifted because I got into the agency side and understood that aspect of my client wants to grow. So it doesn't matter if I do just this or just that, it's more about what is going to give the best ROI. And then depending on the product or service, that's where you make a decision of where to place the advertising. Hmm. So I worked uniquely in a, top 100 ad agency, but was able to really understand the the positioning of why this agency mattered. And then after leaving that agency, I was able to carry that forward, articulate it in a different way. And really, I love the word, the maturation process, hmm. because that's what I believe I live in. And that's what I really love is that maturation process of growth and really learning what that next level is. So. Right. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I have spoken with folks who, I don't want to call them one-trick ponies, but you know what I mean. They, they're really good at, at, at maybe networking or Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads or Google, local, Google, Google My Business would be. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's just not where I'm at. But that's what they sell because that's what they're good at. That's the solution that they see. It's almost like the example you hear of, if a man carries a hammer and that's his tool, he's going to fix everything by banging on it with his hammer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if you'll indulge me again here, uh, another methodology that I teach and I talk about that's really important is to understand that and I'm, I'm building this off of what you just said. 
But when it comes to the simplicity that we think of building a website, oftentimes you're hiring that one person and they have that hammer and that's all they're good at is using that hammer. But if you look a little deeper at, again, there's a lot of ways to look at this, but I'm just gonna stick to one, a website build. What is it that you think? I tell, well, I tell people in my audience, whenever I teach conferences, I say, take a deep breath and envision being a consumer, not a business owner. And as a consumer, what's the first thing you see when you look at a website? And the answer is really simple. It's the visual. It's whatever the user experience is of what you see. And I said, think about the person that should develop that and build that. And what do they thrive in? What environment? And the answer is beautiful environment, light and colors and flowers and something along that. And the, what's the second part of a website? And that's the code. So think about how a coder thrives. And they're very different, but too often companies hire one or the other to build one website and they don't get the full gravity of how these two brains should work together. So when you just hire that hammer, you're not getting whichever side of the world that hammer lives on, you're not getting that other aspect. And if you'll give me one more second here, the third part is probably the most important that most companies don't even have. And that is the strategist. Because the strategist looks at it and says, how do I make these two worlds come together and then how do we make it so that the user has the best experience possible and what flow are we looking for the best user experience? So I love what you said, but I like building off of what you yes. said when it comes to the marketing world, you know? Right. The hammer example is a very simple hammer. It's one that, that I've learned. I learned very young about that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I promote podcast guesting a lot and I understand that's not the right marketing strategy or should I say piece of marketing strategy that everyone should use, but it's right for some people. But I always tell people if you're doing this and you're going to invest time into guesting on podcasts to reach new audiences, it should be a part of your overall marketing strategy. Yeah. It shouldn't be the only thing you're doing and you should make sure it fits with what you are doing. Yeah. Um, because there's, you know, that's, so that's my hammer. <laughs> but I try to look at it with the perspective that I understand that's my hammer when I'm promoting um, reaching new audiences in, with podcast I, guesting. I, it's not all I, I do, think, but it's something I focus on. But I, but I love that you do that. And that's one reason why I, I love that we were able to connect and, and I've loved it and I appreciate it again that you had me here. But you know what I would share with you and, and maybe someone else that listens to this can kind of work this this into their business plan. But you know, Joe, what I would share with you is you're not just a hammer, you're a hammer that has a lot of other features to it. It's a different style of hammer because you can offer things like link and connection. You're offering PR. And I think that there's a lot of other aspects that you offer that I'm aware of when I do this podcast, if I do another podcast, which I'm, I'm on them, just like you have guests, right? Um, but there's a lot to just having a hammer. I think it's more about the positioning, right? Hmm. If you hold a hammer like this, you don't see a whole lot. But if you turn that hammer sideways, you see a lot more. So I think now it becomes the angle that you share walking into that proverbial room and do you see the white or the guitar the bicycle hmm. or the dog and that just becomes to a degree one of the things that i teach is called unique selling position and that is just your usp that now you're talking about of you can sell a hammer and be great at it right and i'm not saying that you should provide every tool in the tool chest right. but it's that unique selling position of how you use that hammer and why it can be applicable to other businesses. Right. And what I found and, and the reason that I focus on podcast guesting, I, I have my own podcast, obviously, um, and I, I just love it. And I think it's a great way to get out there and a very economical way to get out there. But what I found, Joshua, is that I was doing so many things and I've had over 10 businesses on three continents. I've lived overseas for 19 years. And I just found that I was confusing people. I had met people who knew me for two or three years every week at networking events. And 
some of the folks after two or three years came to me and said, Joe, I really just don't know what you do or how you help people, which yeah. surprised the heck out of me. <laughs> You know, one of my one of my uh, writings and sayings is uh, your mom might hate you. If she loved you, she'd tell you the truth, which is you're confusing people and you're not really answering their problem and giving them a solution. You know, and so that my saying is your mom might hate you, you yeah. know, just because, again, that's the interrupt value of what? Why would you say that? And sometimes that's inflammatory to on purpose. Right. To, to generate that. But yeah, I get what you're saying. And uh, I think a lot of people fall into that trap, but that's where a good consultant can help you get out of that trap, right? right? And right. they can help you see the new perspective. And again, that goes back to what we were talking about of companies hire, you know, CMOs that are from outside their industry to help them do exactly what you just said, to say to you, the, the CEO, the business owner go, hey, maybe we're confusing people and then help you develop that faster, be aware of that faster. Right? Yeah, and, and that's the exact process I went through. I hired a coach and yeah. he helped me define things. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, that's great. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time, build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago. In a very real sense, you're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guests and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement. It is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. Joshua, one of the, of the things that you talk about is five things you should do before trusting a digital marketing company. Yeah. What would be the, f let's, we'll go, let's go over all five if we can. I'm going to refer back to my notes to make sure I don't mess it up. So I'll go ahead and plug my book. This is a free book on my website so people can dive into it a little bit deeper. Okay. Can but, we have, you know, let's, first thing, wait, let's have the name of that book, please. And can you hold it up again? Okay. Yeah. So how some, some SEO companies disguise laziness and hide poor strategies. So, you know, it's not to say that all companies are lazy, but the first point is to set proper KPIs, key point indicators. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll use just a, an example here of a client that came to me. We were working on a lot of different things. And um, long story short, we wanted to redevelop the homepage. But it wasn't just because we thought it was bad. In fact, we thought the homepage was very good. But the key was we were not getting enough user engagement where people were clicking through the site. Hmm. So the main purpose of redesigning the homepage was to set a KPI and drive better consumer engagement to get consumers to stay longer and visit more pages. And if we could do that, that was our KPI. So when we set that measurable goal, we then made a change to the website homepage and we watched the metrics now in this case it worked extremely well but again it just came to knowing what we wanted and why right. so when someone comes to a business owner and goes let's change the website why like what are the measurable goals that we're trying to hit and what i would say and i say in my book don't just blindly trust them you should think for yourself is this a measurable goal that's going to lead me to what I want to achieve? And what do I want to achieve? Which is sales, but we got to get beyond sales. We have to think through the first step, the first engagement, the first touch point, the first impression, and every step throughout. Right. So again, point number one is setting measurable goals and the right KPIs so that way you know what you're looking for and how to track it. Exactly. And the first thing I 
ask someone when they say they want to be on more podcasts as guests, I ask them why. What are you looking yeah. to achieve by guesting on podcasts? And I think before you bring, before you begin any project, you should know what you want out of that project. You should know what the results are. If I if I go to the beach and take out a kayak in the ocean, I want to get back to the beach <laughs> alive and well. That's number one. You know, and I want to have fun and I want to want to get some exercise. So that's my goal. Someone else might have a goal of, of fishing or riding the waves or or taking selfies or something. Yeah, you got to know what your goal is. And it's interesting, right? I mean, we we logically think that way, yet we don't logically make our notes in business to think that way. Hmm. Right. It's just second nature, which is operating in beta mode not moving to alpha mode of problem solving of we have a problem which could be we need more sales more leads so on and so forth but we don't logically think through the process like that it's like when you get in your car you don't think about what the d stands for you just know it means drive and you just go right but that's beta mode versus moving to alpha mode so again one more thing that i teach on principles but yeah you you nailed it there yeah um it, it just makes sense no, no. And I think I got that from Stephen Covey's book, Be, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it's begin with the end in mind. Yeah. It's funny because uh, I, I already have that written down in my notes for us to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still have four other points to go through. Um, I, I'll let you decide. Should we hit the four points or should we talk about that? We'll talk about that later. We'll okay. Go through, through the point, so. Uh, so number one, know what you want to get out of your marketing. Yeah. Begin with the end in mind, or as I put it, you know, note, set your KPIs internally before you talk to an agency. Know what your KPIs and what you're looking for and see before you tell them your KPIs, see how many of those KPIs that they hit. How many of them do they go, you know, hey, I think you should do this, this, and this. And if it matches or it's close, and then ask them the second level. Okay, well, these other two or three things you didn't talk about, how would you achieve those? And see what they say, right? And then you're able to really identify that first step. Yes, so. okay, perfect. Okay, so what would step number two be? So step number two is to check their reputation. Look at how reputable they are in the marketplace. One of the things that I would say that I really hang my hat on that I call one of my unique selling positions is that you can Google me as much as you'd like. I've been running my own companies in the marketing world since 2009, and there's not one bad review about me online. None. You, you can look anywhere you'd like, and there's a reason for that. And the main reason is, is that I do what I say I'm going to do. When someone engages with me and hires me, I get it done. And if I can't or something completely fails and I don't meet the level of that contract or agreement that's put into place, I will refund the money because I didn't get the project done that was needing to get done, right? So the reputation I think is important, but not just the reputation. Look at why they have a good reputation or they don't. Because sometimes people just want to complain to complain, and you just can't get around that. But, you know, I'll, I'll leave this point on this part. Whenever I buy something on Amazon, if I'm looking at the reviews, I'll typically look at the reviews, or a restaurant is a good example. I'll look at the reviews, and I'll look at the bad reviews, and I'll see if it's an anomaly. Maybe that server was having a bad day. Maybe that chef doesn't work there anymore because it was three years old and the chef is no longer there, right? There's There can be a reason as to why something, you know, you got a bad rating. You're, so, yeah, you're, but the reputation does matter. I think, sure. you know, it's something to be paid attention to. And that that's point number two. Yeah. You're touching something very close to my heart. I managed a full, uh, a full, restaurant, bar, sports bar, family restaurant. And we got great positive reviews about the food, the service, the experience. And we got some negative reviews. It was in a tourist location. So the summer, there were hour and a half, two hour waits. And we got one star. I had to wait two hours to get a seat. Well, yeah, it's the middle of the summer. <laughs> we can't kick someone out. Like they'll give us a bad review. Right. It's hot. 
the sun was was on the porch and it was very hot. One star. It's like we really can't control that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happens. So I do that. I, I'll look at the five star reviews and then I look I look for the one or two star reviews on Amazon. Yeah. 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 Interesting. 100%. OK, so number three. I, I say make sure they're always learning and what are they learning? So I would tell someone, ask them what the most recent article was that they read or what do they subscribe to? Who do they follow? Um, and what do they, what is, and then go do your own research on who they're following or what they're reading. That can also deepen your knowledge as to what's happening. And you can learn a lot around that of what they're going to do. It also allows you to hold them uh, responsible if, for instance, John Mueller is a name in the SEO world. He works for Google. He's very vocal. He's one of their PR guys that's, that works internally but says a lot you know, publicly. And that's one of the people that I listen to whenever he talks. And it's not always that I agree with him, but I at least understand why he's saying what he's saying. And a lot of it's very foundational. It's, it's a base build. But always learning is really important. You know, what conferences they go to, who do they study, what methodology do they follow and why, and kind of understanding, you know, that, that type of information. Yeah, great. Love that. Number four. My statement is lead from the front. And ultimately what that means is, are they teaching what they've learned and what they've experienced, or are they just sitting in the background just taking in information and not really challenging people's thoughts. And I find that the majority of agencies out there do not have a leader that leads from the front. They have order takers and salespeople, but either A, they don't have a good strategist, and if they do, then they are probably leading from the front. So they're the ones speaking at conferences. They're ones that are on podcasts. They're the ones that constantly have a presence online, even if it's small, right? Even the cobbler kids don't have shoes. Um, so it may be small at times, but find out how much they're teaching. I mean, myself, I'm doing a minimum of eight conferences, speaking at eight conferences a year. And I've been doing that since 2009. Mm. So it's something to be said that people are wanting to follow. They are listening to somebody. They keep coming back. That kind of gives you an idea of the following of are they leading from the front? Yeah, and this ties in to the to the aspect of, of what books are they reading? Who are they listening to? What are they learning? Because the marketing tactics of 1994 are not really valid today in, in the grand view of things. Yeah. So, yeah, being being out there learning and, and, and sometimes even pushing the envelope. We've come to number five. Number five is a little tricky and some business owners don't like it, but this is what I believe to be the best way to do business in the marketing world. And that is make sure that the agency gives you work to do and homework. Oh, but it's I don't want that. that. Wait a minute. I'm paying you a bunch of money. Wait a minute. <laughs> homework. <laughs> there's, there's always something that the business owner should be doing that should be a KPI back to the business owner. And if the agency responds like you did, then I don't believe that the agency is doing their job well enough because the agency's job should be to ask questions. So as a CMO, my, my main job is to work with the business owner and be the executive at their round table, their executive hmm. leadership. What that means is that I need the CEO to help ensure that I have the right vision for the company as they see it. So sometimes that's the KPI or the, the demand that I have from them is to make sure that you're reading what I'm sending out, that you're reviewing what I'm doing. That way we don't go a year down the road and all of a sudden they're angry. Hmm. It's knowing that I have them involved and that they're giving me the feedback. And the best relationships that I have are those clients that don't blindly trust, but 
when I give them homework, I expect them to give it back to me. And let me be clear, it's not about, listen, it is not about you having to do hours and hours of work, but it is about when you're going to work in the marketing world, you know what to look for, you know what to look at. So that starts with that education that I talked about, mm -hmm. but then it goes to me looking at my client. And again, I'm just gonna use myself as the example here, but me looking at my client and saying, okay, Joe, I need you to look at these metrics and I send you an email, but I tell you exactly what to look for. I've got a client right now that came to me and he's working with this ad agency and the metrics since this new ad agency launched his site in two months, he has gone from 600 rankings to 300 rankings in under two months. He's just dropping like a rock. And part of the problem is, is that the agency didn't give him the metrics and the KPIs that he should be following. So he wasn't doing his homework because he didn't know to do his homework. So that's why I say the business owner should be doing homework and the agency should tell you what that homework is. But then that goes back to the beginning, setting proper KPIs. Hmm. And when you know those proper KPIs, that becomes your homework. But again, all of this, these five points really should come from an agency to the business owner as you interview them. And if they don't, then I would say that's cause for concern. It doesn't mean don't hire them, but it is cause for concern to identify why they haven't done that. Right. Now, all of these five points, I almost want to put them all under an umbrella of forming a partnership between the company, or maybe it's the CEO, and maybe it's a, it's someone he has delegated, but between the company and the CMO and yourself, you're forming a partnership because you want information, you want feedback, you want them to do homework. And I'm sure they're giving you homework too. And you're looking at the KPIs. I'm sure some of the discussions are as simple as how are we doing on these KPIs? Well, I mean, is it, I agree with you, but I would say, isn't it the same thing as a CFO? Sure. Right. I mean, logically you look at a CFO and you go, what's my AR, you know, what's my P and L what's my cash flow? I mean, you ask your CPA or your CFO or your bookkeeper, you ask them these same questions. So that relationship is driven there. And one thing I can say for sure as a business owner is we all have someone that's doing our books, even if it's ourselves, very few people, unless you're a CPA, little asterisk there, you have a CPA, you have someone that's helping you with your books. Even if you're the greatest bookkeeper, if you're in any other industry, you have somebody and you have that bond. So if you have that bond and it's that important, then you have operations. You got to have something in the sales and marketing world. And a good CMO typically can touch and work in the sales department. But again, the sales and marketing, that's why they call it sales and marketing, right? Because it does kind of go together. Um, and I personally do have experience in sales, as we talked about my background. But it's kind of understanding that I, I love the way you explain that. But yeah, I mean, when you take that to the next level, I just use the example of what a CFO would do and how you would build your relationship with them and the trust with them and how you hold them accountable with the KPIs. And again, it, it becomes the same thing really yeah it's it's definitely a partnership i mean you i don't know how long it takes to get into a company and understand their culture but i i imagine it takes a little bit of time and there's a lot of communication back and forth you know i don't disagree with that a hundred percent but i've done this long ago or long enough i should say that long ago, I created a business evaluation for businesses to fill out. And I believe, again, I know that I put it together, so I'm going to be a little biased, but I believe that it's one of the strongest uh, business evaluations that you can find out there. So I invite everybody to go download it, review it yourself, copy it, paste it, and write it for yourself. But it really does, the questions that it asks, 90% of business owners that fill it out and talk to me, they all say the same thing, which is, 
wow, this was eye-opening for myself. Mm. This asked me questions that I never really thought about before, and it gave me a new perspective on what I should be doing. And their answer is, right off, this alone, this business evaluation alone, took me to the next level. Without even having to talk to you, Josh, it took me to the next level. So then the only problem with that is now I have a higher bar that I have to, <laughs> you know, to make sure that I get them where they want to go. But you know, the business evaluation, my business evaluation does give me a lot of insight, but it also fast tracks the conversation where I can ask more insightful questions, more pointed questions to get to that level. And that's why I think we were going to talk about this. That's one reason why I do a two hour consultation for free, because with that business evaluation, I can go do my due diligence, research the company and the competitors and then sit down with a mountain of knowledge to do a two hour consultation and, and really hit on the key, what, what I call leverage points to improve the business. And I do all that for free because I don't think a 20 minute conversation, a 20 minute free consult is going to give you what you need as a marketing agency or company. It's not going to give you what you need to understand your narrative. And again, I, I use that word very strongly, your narrative of where you've been. And Joe, you've asked me this question in a different way, but you said, Josh, what's your narrative? You know, what was high school like? Mm -hmm. What did you do after high school? How did you turn into the business? Where are you at now? These are the questions that you ask me organically, and that is my narrative. So for me to understand a business owner's narrative and all the little leverage points, details that I need to know, I that's how I go about doing it. So again, that's me, but I found that it's very effective in the specific questions that I ask. Yeah, I, I would agree with you 100%. I don't know your questionnaire. I have not looked at it, but it reminds me a lot of mine. I ask a lot of questions from to my private clients and they've come back and said that was that was amazing. When I had to answer those questions, I had to dig deep to answer those questions and it takes me hours to go through it and it is the it is the seedlings for a full blown full blown garden of conversations if you will and um the longest response i ever had and the only reason i know this was because i was reading the fellow's responses and i said i got to check how many words this is 10,000 words <laughs> in the answers yeah. to my questions. Now, that's an extreme example. If you remember the bell curve, it's way over. <laughs> that's yeah, 25, pa too much. 25 pages in a book. Yeah, he's, well, he's very prolific, very smart individual and very deep thinker. Um, yeah. But I got, you know, with that questionnaire from that client and other clients, it kind of shortcuts the path to learning what they're all about yeah. and where they want to go. Yeah. yeah. So, Josh, we have come to the section of the podcast that I like to call the lightning round. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go. How has your entrepreneurial journey transformed you? It's taught me to trust my gut a lot more. When I have when I have something that's going on and I feel a certain way, I've learned over the years to know when to trust my gut and. Uh, and, and it's that that gut has turned into instinct. And that instinct is something that I definitely trust now. OK, very good. What most surprised you as a business owner? I would say there's probably two things. One is how hard and this kind of goes to your other question about challenge, but how hard it is to keep up with the books, because when I talk about the different mindsets, my mind does not do bookkeeping very well. I, my brain doesn't work in that fashion. But the other one is really going to be, it. it's definitely difficult to find good people, people that have your best interest in mind, the company's best interest in mind. Um, and I find that common. Nowadays, you can hire people, you can find people to do the job, but to really commit to the vision of the company is a lot more difficult. It is more difficult. Yes. Yes. I, wow. So when I, when I was running the restaurant, we had 42 employees and that year I did 140 W2s. So we had a hundred, well, we had 98 people 
come and go within the year. Yeah. And just finding the right people and people who who incorporated and embodied the vision that I was trying to create in that restaurant. Yeah. I use just, I guess, a quick bullet point to that would be, I use some different methodology when it comes to interviewing people. And one of the things that I ask them is, you know, I, I ask them some of the narrative questions, tell me about your background, how you grew up. And it's much more conversational than it is interview type. And I try to do it in a relaxed environment to see what their body language is, what their personality is. And I do my best to try to kind of catch them off guard on some things, but ask them about their family, about their kids, if they have kids, do they want kids? What do they enjoy doing? And see how relationship driven they are and what their passions are. And I think it does give some insight. And again, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not perfect at it. I still believe that I suck at it because I believe in the good in people more than I look for the bad. So therefore I gravitate to the positivity that someone will give me rather than the negativity. And that can make me a bad hiring manager at times, but I am good at looking at the insights and asking those questions when it comes to ad agencies on the technical efficiency. So that part I know, but everything else, <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> okay. What unexpected challenge have you had to overcome? I, I just said it a minute ago. It is bookkeeping. bookkeeping. It is. It's just how books are ran and why they're ran that way. I'm like I look at the book, the bank account, and I'm like, look, it should just be this simple. You know, this is the money due. This is the money I got. But instead, it's just, yeah. <laughs> and I'm lucky enough to have a great CPA that I hired in 2014 and a bookkeeper that I hired two years ago. But when you talk about the restaurant and hiring people. About two years ago, I went in a matter of, of 45 days, I went through 15 different bookkeepers wow. and it was a nightmare until I fi finally found one that I just, I absolutely adore. And it's been a year and a half, two years now, two years now. So yeah, so I'm lucky now, but oh, it's been terrible. Yeah. Some, sometimes <laughs> it, it takes a lot of work and going through a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. In all industries, I'm sure. Yeah. What book has made a big impact on you and who would you recommend it to? I'd recommend it to everybody and anybody. And the book is what we talked about earlier, The Seven Habits by oh. Steve Covey. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Very I mean, it's all about psychology and whether yeah. you try to apply that to your business life or your personal life, it's applicable. It right? is very Begin with the end in mind. If you're dating, what's the end in mind? Is it to get married or just have fun with an individual? Yeah. Right. I mean, it's everything is tied i hate to go down a rabbit hole but I'll, I'll i'll try to keep this short on this part but dating and personal life is just the same as business right i tell business owners no one cares what your name is and when i tell people that a lot of times they get offended and i say look i married my wife not because of her name i married her because of the ethics morals and values that she brought to my life that I felt like made me better. Huh. It gave me something that I don't feel like I had before. So that's why I married her. If she wanted to change her name tomorrow or today, I would say, okay, cool, let's talk about it. If it's that important to you, go ahead. But that's why, you know, no one cares what the name is. But then I go back to the seven habits. It's the same thing. It's, you know, the commitment, the consistency, it's the authority, it's the social proof. You know, it's it's all of these elements that, that go into it. So, yeah. yeah. Now, I read that book a, a year or so before I had children. And some of the lessons in that book, and he does talk about raising his child. And some of the lessons in that book, I applied directly to raising my children. And it, thank God I had the book, you know, and, and read that and, and saw things from a different perspective. Yeah. And I will plug one other thing. I would also recommend my book. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less. <laughs> Very good. I couldn't be so vain to and, not. <laughs> and of course, we'll have links to all of those resources in the show notes. Last question. What advice would you give to an inspiring entrepreneur in your industry? Yeah, number one, you got to build a, a USP. Your unique selling position is, is everything. And uh, that can be hard to do. There has to be a maturation process typically to that. But 
your unique selling position is really what defines you. It is who your company is. Uh, different people call it different things. Um, if you looked up unique selling position or what's the number one thing to do when you start a business, it really is your unique selling position. And and I would say within that, you've got to get rid of the platitudes. Hmm. You know, I do conferences and one of them that I do is a training session on how to write a marketing plan for today's age. And I ask people, I, I walk around and I put them on hot take and I say, tell me what makes you unique. And I hear the same platitudes. I've been in business this long. I'm great. I'm ethical. I'm honest. You know, I'm above board. Other people don't do this and I do it. It just, and I usually sit there and I start going like this and counting all the different platitudes that they give me. Um, and then I look at them and go, you gave me seven platitudes in 30 seconds. It's not good enough, you know? And then I go to the next person, the next person. And it's, it's interesting to see how many times this happens. And, um, and you've got to get away from those platitudes and you've got to work on how, how you are unique to the marketplace and what makes you more important than anyone else. And you have to stand out. So I, I did a blog post one time. It was just say no to platitudes. And the other thing I used to do on live webinars, I would say, let's, let's find out why websites are, are not differentiated. Why websites all look the same. Give me a city, give me an industry. And I'll Google it, and I opened up, you know, four, five, six, seven tabs, whatever it might be. Every single website looked the same. It doesn't matter if I was looking at painters or yard work or, or lawyers. Because, and I told them, you know, when you build a website, you go to a web designer and you say, I want, I'm a plumber, and I want a plumber's website. I want, what's the website guy going to do? He's going to go look at other websites from plumbers and say, oh, that's what they look like. That's that's how we do it. So that's why they end up looking the same for the most part. I mean, it's I did it live and I was I was confident they would look the same. And they always did. <laughs> if you ever want to know someone's stress level psychologically, when you talk to them or they talk to you about something, the higher on the face that they go of rubbing, the more agitation they have. And when you talk about that, I literally just. I lose my mind because you just <laughs> nailed it. The catch that some people like to tell me is, well, I'm a plumber and I got a rank for plumbing, so I have to talk about plumbing. Yes, but you still can position it different. You can still come up with a unique selling position. Do you need to have a plumber with his crack? No. Do you need to show pipes and tools? Maybe, but a lot of times you have to figure out what your unique selling position is and paint that with images. And, and I'll leave you with one other thing on this thought process. And again, this kind of goes to my methodology, but if you think about, if I say the word shark, something pops into your head. Mm -hmm. If I say the word fish, something pops similar into our heads. If I say the word computer or phone, something visual pops into our head. But when we say the word famous or popular, Everyone has a different hmm. thought. So you have to learn how to paint the USP with pictures, your unique selling position with pictures to really paint that story and work on that engagement and identify, are you the USP or is something that you do in the methodology, the USP? And then you work on positioning that with the designer rather than just telling the designer, Hey, go build me a website. And again, that goes to the three brains, right? The designer, the coder, and the strategist. Mm -hmm. That's why a strategist is extremely important because the strategist can extract that unique selling position from your mind and then help you apply it with a design. Yeah, perfect. That's That sounds like a process that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, Joshua. Do you have any final words or any gifts for our listeners today? So we've talked about it a little bit throughout. Um, again, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate everyone that's listening now. Uh, I offer a free two-hour consultation. And the one thing that I've learned in my business is, you know, I, I leave it at two things that I've learned that are my primary. And one is, is that if I give the best user experience and I give the best knowledge to everybody, that those two user experience and knowledge that I give away for free, they're gonna come back. 
It's like, why do we all use Google? Because when we search for something, we find answers. So I try to model my business like Google has modeled theirs in the way of business will come to you. You can make revenue if you have something good to say. So I have something good to say and I try to say it well and say it often, which again is another principle to use. But I like to give a lot of free information. If nothing else, I get to learn something. I get to meet someone new. I get to learn something new and see how they see the world which we talked about, and that's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to hear people's stories and their narratives, where they came from and why. Uh, so I just, I love that. And that's that's my main offer is that free two hour consultation. And then again, there's a ton of information on my website. Um, and I think you were gonna put the link up there, yeah. but it's jrcmo.com. Think Josh Ramsey, chief marketing officer.com. That's, that's the website and you know, uh, on that information, I have the world's largest SEO library. I have a lot of uh, free information throughout the site, including my book and a free download of my book. So I'm happy to help anybody out there that's just trying to get, get their feet under them or have some frustrations or questions and wanting to vent and talk about it. You know, that's what I'm here to help it's, with. It's one of the things I admire about you, Joshua, and the way you run your business is that you are helping the folks who just want to DIY it. And if they find that that's what they're thinking, but they find it's it's more complicated, more complex than than they have time to invest and learn, then they can hire you. But they yeah. can get started. They can learn about it with all the free information that you have out there. You know, my biggest clients have come to me because I've met them years before and I've given them free information as a startup. And they've grown to massive companies and now they've come back and re-engaged with me. And I attribute that heavily to, I gave them free information in the beginning. You know, I just helped them when they felt like no one else was going to help them. And as I've helped them grow, I feel good about what I'm doing. And that equals my ethics, morals, and values. That's, that fulfills my purpose of being able to help. And that's really my number one thing is I wanna help people as much as I can. Um, and that means I'm willing to give my time to, to help give them a direction. Yeah, you're walking the talk, my friend. Joshua, this has been a great conversation and very informative and fun conversation. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. Thanks for having me, Joe. I really do appreciate your time as well. Thank you, my pleasure. Bye now. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneur Journeys. Remember to subscribe so you catch all the episodes and check out the show notes for any free giveaways or gifts that were mentioned during this show. Entrepreneur Journeys is brought to you by Apexable, providing the insights, tools, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your show host, Joe Matz, and until next time, I hope your journey is filled with breathtaking views and successful outcomes.